Lieutenant Colonel Nothing Fancy reporting for duty, sir. Not really. I'm all done with that. You guys know that. Retired from the United States Air Force. Hey guys, this is Nothing Fancy running the Nothing Fancy project. We're moving on into year four. Here comes a series of videos that I think my friends, my subscribers around the world are really going to like. It's called Air Force Stories by Net and Fancy, and I'm going to get very real with you guys. I'll be very forthcoming about the details of my military experience, the lessons I've learned, funny stuff that happened, scary stuff that happened, and I'm going to do my best to share them with you like we're sitting around the fireside, talking, chatting, getting real. Uh, lots to say, and actually, it's going to be, I think, really interesting for you guys, uh, especially those of you who are perhaps contemplating service in the U.S. Air Force, maybe another branch of service, because a lot of the lessons I'm going to attempt to impart via story form, I love stories, don't you? They'll play in any military service, they really will. I'm going to talk about principles of leadership, dedication, principles of work, many of which I covered in Workers Are Few video, philosophy video I posted a while back. And uh, it's just going to be fun. And I don't know how I'm going to organize it. I was just going to tell stories. But then as I started getting my stories, I started reviewing my log books. I, I started thinking, you know, there's really a lot of lessons in here. Things that have changed the way I perceive life. Things that were validated in my approach to life. Some of which you've already seen in my philosophy videos. And then things, lessons I had to learn the hard way. And uh, integrated into the kind of person I've become. So, a uh, 20-year Air Force pilot. I'm going to tell you about that here in a second. First, we need a banner. I don't have my banner up. It keeps falling down with duct tape. Boop. There you go. We'll do the electronic banner on this series of videos. I think they'll run about 40, 45 minutes a piece. Don't know how many I'll do. It just depends on the stories, the length. I think, again, they'll be interesting to you guys. Uh, a couple ground rules, okay? Uh, yep, this is my actual U.S. Air Force uniform. On for this series of videos, uh, retired as a lieutenant colonel, U.S. Air Force, you guys know that. Now, in face, why don't you tell this to us before, like two years ago? Uh, there's a couple reasons. One, I was in a deployment unit. I was deploying for months on end. Did you guys even know that? Like in 08, 09, a lot of the videos were posted from overseas. Huh? Yep. Overseas, so I left my family, my house for months on end, you know, for security reasons. Not a great idea to tell people you're in a deploying military unit. Who knows who's out there? You know, there's some whack jobs on the internet. And there's some no kidding enemies. I'm talking Al Qaeda types that would love to get that information. That's why, security. And I still roll that way. In other words, as far as divulging certain details about what, you know, my jobs that I'm doing currently and stuff like that, I still don't. You know, when the time's right, I'll divulge it. And guess what? The time's right for my Air Force stuff. I'm going to be very forthcoming with you guys. I'm going to tell you my military units, what planes I flew. Yep, may throw a few names in there. Some have been changed to protect the innocent, or I'll do that as I go. <laughs> Man, this is going to be so fun. It really is. Uh, okay, ground rules, we're talking. I don't want to sit in front of the camera and act like that I'm some Joe hero, or that my military service is any better than anybody else's. I am not one of those guys that says, well, the Air Force is the best service out there. Nor do I like it when they say the Marines are the best service or the Army is the best service or whatever. Coast Guard's best service. And, you know, I, it's okay to kid around with that, and I kid around with that. I mean, you see me with my now in Afghanistan buddy, Inadvert and Smell family friend. He's actually a good friend of Tactical Doodles, my son. Serving in Afghanistan, I bust him on him all the time. And other, actually, guys I know that are Marines, it's hilarious. We'll bust back and forth. But when it comes down to getting serious, I respect all the services. I respect all the service that the men and women of the armed forces put forth. And I feel very sincerely about that. I dedicated a huge portion of my life to the United States military because I believe so strongly in it. I felt like, and I'm kind of jumping the gun here, but I felt like I owed a debt to the country to the freedom that I inherited from those who came before me. Okay, so there's some realness for you. I told you it was going to be real. Well, there'll be more of that as we go on. Um, but I don't want to stand up here or sit in front of you and act like that I'm Joe Hero or that I'm cool or I'm this or that. I'm just going to tell you. I'm going to tell you how the story's ended. You know, sometimes I did some things really right, and sometimes I did some things that weren't so good. I'll try to be honest with you guys. So I'm no better or no worse than anybody else. Um, and it's my philosophies. 
you know, everything you see in the Nut and Fancy project, whether it's a take on a gear item, a gun, a knife, tactical item, my backpacking philosophies, it's all me. You know, it's all real. It's just the way I am. It's how I perceive life. I think a lot of you guys, actually most of you guys, will really connect with what I'm saying here. And you'll, you'll find, even if you're not in the United States military or any military, some of our allies are overseas, which are awesome, and I served with them as well throughout my 20 years. Love those guys. Uh, I might tell you some of those stories as well. Um, you know, it, it, you will still find some parallels that will be useful to you. The, in, in any organization, you'll go, yep, I know that type of person. <laughs> and I'm actually, and as we go along, speaking of my philosophies, I'm, I'm actually more of General Patton than General Westmoreland, if that's a great example. That I'm, I really like the warrior mentality and everything that, I did in my Air Force career, you can ask anybody who served with me, is very much along those lines. I don't believe in nonsense. I eschew, is that a word? I think so. Political correctness. Hate it. Okay, if it does not directly contribute to your war fighting capability, I'm not interested. And I spent my whole career saying it as it was. I was very well known for that, being upfront. And I was just honest, and we'll talk about that. Um, I learned also ground rules, we're talking still, that I never took enough videos, I never took enough photos. Okay, so for you guys and gals in the U.S. military, and any military for that matter, take more photos, take more video, and don't listen to the idiot next to you going, oh, you're taking more hero shots, huh? I heard that every time. Every time I got on the ramp and I was taking a picture of a T-38, C-12, whatever, they're like, oh, hero shot. I'm like, oh, well, yeah, but you know, I'm not always going to be doing that job. Huh, what do you know? Here I am. 20 years later not doing the job and it would be really cool for me to have a lot more photos and video to roll in to you guys. Um, I did take some and I've trans I've learned how to transfer it finally over to the digital medium and so I'm going to roll in some when it's appropriate if I can find it. Pictures here and there. I have a whole boatload of uh, memorabilia on the table I'm going to show you as we go along. Uh, and again I'm not bragging, not doing any of that. I'm just trying to be honest and making it fun. And then also you need to understand, this is another ground rule, is that every job in the, in the military has its own unit culture. Not just unit culture, but weapon system culture. So I am a product of the planes I flew, that culture, which I think is pretty cool, actually. Uh, and everything's like that. You drive an M1 Abrams tank in the USMC, it's going to have its own culture. There's things which are considered the norm for that culture. There's things which are considered CS, I'll explain that. And that's normal. You cannot get away from it. You need to adapt to it. And then when you get respected enough, you might be able to impact it with your own way of being. Here's my note card. Check that out. This is I'm going to do the entire series of videos. Off this, let's get going. How did I come to join the United States Air Force? Uh, I've had a lot of people ask me uh, in person and also in messaging here on YouTube, you know, uh, why would you do it? How come you're not, I mean, you run and gun so much, you're so tactical, how come you're not a Marine? Here's the real answer. is because I wanted to affect the battlefield to my maximum potential. There's your honest answer. That when I was a teenager and I said, you know what, I'm going to do this Air Force thing. Or I'm not, actually, I wasn't totally solidified yet. I said, I'm going to do the military thing. I wanted to impact the battlefield to wreak as much damage as I possibly could. How's that for an answer? <clears throat> I'm not even kidding with you. And I, at the time, what I wanted to do is be an A-10 Warthog pilot. You didn't know that, did you? I want to be an A-10 pilot. I want to be a cast guy, close air support. I want to be the guy that rolled in over the hills, saving those guys on the ground. Not to be a hero, but to save lives. That's what motivated me. That, that I had studied in junior high school and high school, heck, in grade school, World War II history, which I'm very well versed in. I knew how it worked, you know, on through the 30s, late 30s when Germany started moving, uh, the European campaign, the Pacific campaign, on into Korea. I, I had a lot of understanding of how it went and how important close air support could be, and that's what motivated me. I want to be an A-10 guy. And I want to have a 30 millimeter cannon and uh, wreak havoc, man, and go to war. That's why I went to the Air Force. I actually did look into uh, joining other services, and I... Oh, there was one other thing that factored into it, and this is really important, is I knew that on the other side, I was life planning. You remember that whole thing I talked about in Plan Your Life, or Live to Impress Yourself, that video? 
I, w I knew I wouldn't be in the military forever, and I wanted to have a life skill, too, that, I, that would be marketable, that I could do something with. So I said, how can I mesh these two things together to wreak as much damage on the battlefield as possible? <laughs> I'm laughing, because it's true, and also to have a life skill. Bam! Air Force. That's what I looked at. Why didn't you go Navy? Huh. Looked into that, too. I was like, oh, I could be a Navy. I could have easily gone in the Navy. But Carrier for six months? What? Total dudes on there? No. And then I looked at like, well, I want to have a family. I want to have kids. And the Navy lifestyle just didn't seem really suited to that. Okay, so there you go. I decided going to, you know, be an Air Force dude. And I'm pretty happy with that decision. I'm really happy, actually. I would change a thing that I did. How'd you get your commission? Nothing fancy. Great question. And I got it through ROTC. If I would to, if I were to do it all over again, and by the way, I don't know if you see this, but right here, A and G baby, Air National Guard. I like I did my last ten years of military service in a reserve component, 151st Air Refueling Wing. They rock, by the way, Utah Air National Guard. Um, I would have gotten sponsored by a National Guard unit. That is the bomb, dudes. That's how you get your commission. They'll send you to their little boot camp to become an officer, and then they sponsor you through undergraduate pilot training. Um, and I will tell you this, UPT, and I'm going to really strive to not impart a lot of jargon to you, because there is a lot of jargon in our flying job, and I'm usually pretty good at explaining things in layman's terms. I might slip here and there. Undergraduate pilot training is the process which you get your pilot wings. Okay, It's a two-phase process. You go to... Uh, primary jet train and advanced jet training. When I went through, the aircraft I flew were T-37s and T-38s. I'll show you pictures here in just a second. And before you get there, though, you, in the United States Air Force, you have to get a four-year college degree. I did that at a university, and I went through a ROTC program as I did it. I went to summer camp, uh, it's called advanced training program between my, I think it was that, before my junior year in college, I went to ATP, and then I graduated, okay, uh, and then you have to compete, there's a very important point, to compete for a slot just to go to pilot training. Now it ebbs and flows as time goes on, in other words, there might be a lot of slots in pilot training some years, and when I went through and I graduated college, there were very few slots. It was extremely competitive to get a slot in UPT. Very tough. Back to the National Guard thing or the reserve unit thing, you don't compete in that process. Those units get those slots. I wish I had known this. I um, actually went up to the 419th flying F-105 Thunder Chiefs at the time. And I'd already signed on the dotted line with ROTC, and I walked up and was like, my dad had told me, he's like, why didn't you get sponsored? He was alive at the time. He's like, why don't you get sponsored by the 419th up at, you know, Hill? And I was like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> really don't know. Walked in, talked to their commander. I think his name was Colonel Green back then. Total, total stud. Great guy. He goes, yeah, we'd love to have you. You know, I can't guarantee anything. Throw your package in. We'll consider you. But for sponsoring. And I said, oh, yeah, by the way, I signed the line on ROTC. And he's like, oh, you're committed. And I was like, oh, Newman. <laughs> Because it's cool, the A and G guys, they go down to U and UPT and they don't compete. They already have a guaranteed job. They're going to their guard unit. They're going to their reserve unit in the plane they fly. They just go through UPT and then they go to the training for their specific aircraft at rocks. Another way you can go through is OTS. You can be an enlisted guy and then you can compete. There's always competition. Everything is competition in the Air Force. And it's that way in the Navy. All the services are that way. Heck, to be an Army Ranger, you're competing to get into that school. That weeds out the uncommitted it's a good thing. You can go to OTS, get your commission there. You still have to go get your four-year degree, compete for a UPT slot, and then you can go to a service school, and that brings us to the Air Force Academy. Did you ever consider that that fancy? Um, yeah, I actually did, and I came very close to going to the Air Force Academy. I had all my applications in. I had my approvals. Getting ready to pull the trigger on it, and then my dad, who also was a experienced Air Force pilot. He was a fighter pilot his whole career. Here he is standing in front of the T-38, super stud. He named that plane, by the way, the Talon. That's right. My dad named the T-38 Talon in an Air Force-wide naming contest. And he flew the F-100, OV-10, O-1 Bird Dog, T-38, T-39. He had a very illustrious Air Force career. So, yeah, when he spoke, I listened. And he goes, you know what? If I were you, I would not go to the Air Force Academy. I would 
sound just like do ROTC like and that way you can mm-hmm. find a hot wife. <laughs> Like get married and have kids and stuff yeah. and that was an important part of my plan it wasn't you know like unlike some of my buddies that were like laser beam focused man air force pilot air force pilot i was like seeing the big picture yeah air force and military service is an important part of something i want to do i'm going to dedicate a lot of my life I might die in the process to be real seriously um, but I, I want to have a backside to that life and that plan seemed to work out good that's why my son tactical due to one eye or we're like buddies. You guys see us on camera all the time because we had them pretty young. It was by design. It wasn't an accident. I wanted to have my kids young in my life. I was in my early 20s when Tactical Doodle popped out. And then um, later on, my last son, uh, last suspect came out. Okay, so that's the three ways you can go. I went the ROTC route. Which one would you recommend? I would probably go the route I did. Um, ROTC is great. It's, uh, it's awesome. If you can get a, an appointment through the reserve unit of your choice, um, be advised, it's extremely competitive. I know because I sat on the board, the hiring board at Utah Air National Guard, and I saw all the packets come across the table, and I'm looking at them, and I'm looking over the candidates, and I was, I was helping make our unit the decision on whether to hire these guys, whether they're good guys, what's their qualifications, are they motivated, all that good stuff. Some of that I've rolled into the, st- the philosophy videos already. There you have it. That's what I did. I cannot tell you how hard undergraduate pilot training is. It's something you actually have to experience. Uh, it, it could have very well changed since I went through, because I went through in 1992, a long time ago. Um, but it's very difficult. Nothing is a given in UPT. Uh, when I went through, the washout rate in both aircraft was extremely high. I don't. I didn't go back and review the numbers, but I think we had like a, I think 50% washout rate. Of everybody who started in T-37s, and here's a T-37 tweet, most of the washouts occurred in this aircraft, in primary jet. And what they're teaching you there is how to be a pilot, the discipline, the habit patterns, you know, instrument cross checks, formation flying, low level flying, all those skill sets that you're gonna to need to your fall on aircraft, whether it's a fighter, heavy, whatever, Nowadays they do a different aircraft, but when I went through a T-37, great plane, loved it. It's just a tank. They did an, uh, an attack version of this. They sold to the South Vietnamese during the Vietnam War, and it was a A-37. That thing's a little hot rod. has a lot better motors in it. And then you graduate. If you graduate T-37s, you move on to T-38s. What a sweet-looking plane that is. How awesome is that? Yeah, it looked great. In my video, Live to Impress Yourself, this is... This is a plane I opened with, that footage, the T-38, still flying. They have some new avionics upgrades for it. It's just a gorgeous plane, Northrop T-38. Love it, supersonic trainer. They have a fighter version of it. This is actually a quite different plane, the F-5, that we sold uh, overseas for a while. Okay, if you make it through UPT, dude, you have done something. And this will get me to my first point. Expect fear, conquer fear. Expect fear and conquer fear. What do you mean? Well, I'll tell you what. When I started undergraduate pilot training, by no means was I like, oh, man, yeah, I'm going to rock this program. I really wasn't sure. You know, one of the problems I had in T-37 phase is down there in Texas, dudes, I had some serious allergies. Oh, my gosh. I mean, I was doing a spin. And for your reference, what that is, you take the T-37 up, I don't know, 23,000 feet. Instructor kicks a rudder. Puts the aircraft in an intentional spin and around, around you go. Woo, woo, woo. You know, when you do the T 37 bold face to pop out of the spin, spinning left, right, or right, whatever it was. I kind of forget it. A lot of guys remember that, like, oh, I know the spin bold face. I'm like, I've totally forgotten it. <laughs> I know generally what to do to get out of it. As I was doing that, though, my ears were clogging. One day I landed, I had ear uh, blood coming out of my ears. Yeah. You know, just so draining, like crap, nasal what? draining. I mean, I couldn't clear my ears. It was. Really, really <sighs> difficult. I can't even tell you. I mean, I was married to Mrs. Nutt and Fancy back then, and I'd come home from a T-37 ride. Sometimes we're double turning during the primary jet, and I was like, oh my gosh, I was exhausted, and I was scared. I didn't know if I was going to make it through primary jet on physiological reasons alone. But you did get a haircut. Uh, it was it was a lot of work, and then you you know you double turn that day, and then you come home and you hit the books and you study because you have academic tests pretty much every day. You will have a quiz every day, and then you'll have some big tests once a week. And I just buckled down. I didn't mess around. I had no time for watching movies. 
video games as if that's back in 1992 anyhow no you ain't got time for that uh, you're too busy working and keeping your mind on the goal and that is getting these Air Force wings right here I'm not going to tell you the process is perfect I mean there's some Air Force pilots that got their wings and I was like dude or dudette some female pilots and I go oh my gosh how did you graduate pilot training I just don't get it I just don't get it but yeah the process does a pretty good job of teaching you some pretty important stuff. Um, expect fear, conquer fear. Um, way I address it in, in not so much pilot training, but it's pretty much my follow-on aircraft, and I think I need to speak to that. I hope I'm not boring you guys. Uh, I guess I'm gonna have to go back and give you some background to how that transpired, how I got the aircraft I did. I told you guys I wanted to be an A-10 pilot. Another thing that happens and transpires in undergraduate pilot training is that the ever-changing assignment process, okay? In other words, there's some aircraft that are available and there's some aircraft that just aren't available. When I graduated, the Air Force was very pilot heavy. They didn't need a lot of pilots. Guys graduating, I think there were 16 or 17 of us that ended up graduating out of T-38s. By the way, I was in F flight, Hill Rio, that is Del Rio, Texas, in T-37s. Then I went into Ogres. Captain Tom Powers was our flight commander. Graduated Ogres, that is O Flight, in T-38s at Del Rio, Laughlin Air Force Base. In the assignment night, we had one fighter come down, and that fighter was a banked fighter. fighter. In other words, uh, our dude, whose name was Tom, our number one graduating guy, student, he used to be an F-111 uh, uh, weapons officer dude, uh, he got that slot. And it was a banked fighter, so I think he ran a desk for two years, and then actually the Air Force was true to those guys, and they gave them the fighter training, and then they were given cockpits. I think Tom went to F-15s. Last time I heard, he was uh, actually a uh, wing commander or group commander, F-16 unit up at Ogden. Cool. Uh, I didn't graduate at the top of my class for daily flight scores. When everything was said and done, totaled up, I was number two. Uh, and I'm talking like, how did you do day by day by day? But for officership and all the other stuff that goes in, I know I'm such a Weisenheimer and I speak my mind a lot. I think I was ranked like middle of the pack. So for I think overall assignments, I chose like number six or something for my, my planes. And when I got up to the board, I actually had some really distinct preferences of what I wanted and what I didn't want. And at that time, I gotta be honest with you, I really didn't want a fighter anymore. Why, dude? You said you wanted to be A-10. I know I did. Well, when I went to ATP, that is a dra advanced training program, I flew with these guys. Here comes some memorabilia. These are uh, squadron scars from all the units which hosted me. That is a freaking hilarious story. Story I might have to tell you that. This might be like an eight-parter. That's not one. Here we go. And these are actually AT-38 squadrons. Uh, AT-8, I can't speak, AT-38 squadrons. They're now used as fighter lead-in aircraft. They look very similar to the T-38. They're just painted in that camouflage colors. I'll roll in some footage right now. now when I went to ATP, I was hosted by the AT-38 squadron, and also the Iron Knights, which at the time were flying F-15s. And if you've ever seen me standing in front of an F-15, that's during that phase. That's ATP, and I had multiple F-15 rides with those guys. I wasn't a qualified Air Force pilot at the time, um, but I was already signed on the dotted line. I was going to go in the Air Force, and so they're like, here you go. Here's your host unit. I learned then in that unit, in that experience, that I probably wasn't a great fit for the F-15 world or maybe the whole fighter world. Um, I love the fighter guys, but it is a different community. We're getting back to unit culture, and the unit culture there is very hard charging, you know, braggadocious and, you know, wise asses and they think they're God's gift to aviation and all that. I'm not saying that's a bad thing because an air-to-air -air mission like the F-15Cs, which I flew in, they kind of have to be that way. It's a very cutting edge weapon system, at least it was at the time, and you've, you've got to be on your game. You know, you've got to be a warrior in that plane. Um, and also, uh, I'd had Tactical Doodle, my son, and my whole perception changed. Cl uh, changed. Clinton was came into office later on. I didn't really like the military decisions that were being made. I didn't like the fact that I might be dropping ordnance directly on top of somebody that I didn't politically support the mission. And so that was kind of factored into it. I know I'm still in the Air Force. I'm still supporting that mission. But those two things kind of changed my my motivation to fly fighters. 
and there you go. So when I stood up, I chose the most awesomest of planes ever. KC-135, baby. What? That's not a weapon system, nothing fancy. Oh, yes, it is. Studliest plane in the world, if you ask me. That's an A model. Throughout my career, I flew all models of KC-135. Not all. I flew A's, T's, and R's. And Q's. I didn't fly RT's. That is the refuelable one. Thank heavens. Just another qualification to keep up on. Hey, your qualification of refueling's ran out. Oh, great. i got to go do that now. Oh, my gosh. So, chose the KC-135. One of the reasons I chose it is because at the time it had T-38 Ace attached to it. Sick. In other words, ACE stood for Accelerated Co-Pilot Enrichment Program. Here I am standing, just like my dad was many years later, in front of the T-38. This actually belonged to the B-52 squadron up at Minot Air Force Base. This was taken in June of 1993 on a cross-country down in San Antonio with my buddy. Look how sick that plane is. Looks like a little F-5 gray. They're painted the same colors as their B-52s were. And so when I chose that plane, I was like, whoa, T-38 Ace? Yeah, I'm up for that. You know, I'd be a co-pilot for four years, three years, whatever the upgrade time was. So I went to Minot, North Dakota. Minot, North Dakota. And en route, I went to water survival training at Homestead Air Force Base for ejection seat aircraft. Now Homestead is gone. It got wiped out by hurricanes shortly after I graduated. It's really cool, though. The water survival program, amazing. Take you out there. They hoist you up on a parachute, they cut you loose, you drift, drift down into the bay, deploy your raft, you sit there and float for an hour or two while you wait for the Coast Guard helicopter to come pick you up, you go through your, you know, port and water in the, the raft for your extraction procedures, you do some jungle survival, you do signaling, uh, we did oh, so much fun stuff there, zip lines into water, what a sick, sick program that was. The only reason I got that is because I was assign, assigning to an ejection seat aircraft at T-38. Am I boring you guys yet? Okay, so, and then I went to land survival up at Fairchild Air Force Base and SURI training. I went through POW training there, uh, pretty hardcore, pretty hardcore. There's more hardcore. I've heard stories. I know all my buddies and all the other services. I've heard all the stories. Yeah, uh, it's great training. I can't go into the details there. It's survival training, I got there too. Pretty cool. I'd always been an outdoor guy, so for me it was pretty much a party. <laughs> uh, the escape and evasion was honestly a joke. It was just, it was just funny because guys were taking all serious. Oh man, they're after us. You hear gunfire, and I was like, you know, GI Joe. I was in my element. Can you imagine? <laughs> okay, so I got the KC-135. I'm still under the talking point of expect fear and conquer it. Time pressed on. And I probably upgraded to aircraft commander sooner than I thought I would. And it wasn't at Minot, North Dakota, because my follow-on assignment was actually Fairchild Air Force Base in Spokane, Washington. Man, I love Spokane. What a great place to live that was. We were there for six years. I was at Minot for almost three, like two and a half, six and a half, actually, at Spokane. And actually, the squadron I was in at Minot, North Dakota, flying the KC-135s, first A models, and then uh, R models was a 906. Now decommissioned. I think they flew B-17s in World War II, and then they transitioned to all kinds of different aircraft. Up in Minot, we're actually a ge geographically separated unit, a GSU. Uh, up in Minot, North Dakota. By the way, I hate North Dakota. <laughs> oh my gosh. If you're in North Dakota, I don't mean that offensively, but oh, I just hated it. There's nothing up there, man. It's like cold. It's windy. I'm talking really cold, like 20 below zero, 30 below zero. You need a heater in your car. Then when it warms up, we lived in base housing, the sewage ponds would warm up and turn, it smelled like sewage for two weeks solid, the mosquitoes would come in and suck you dry of blood, then I'm like taking a little baby tactical zoodle out to go shoot, and there's nowhere to go shoot, and it's all private land. I'd have to drive an hour just to find a place to shoot. Even though North Dakota is all flat farmland, there's nothing there. Hated it. The only thing I loved about North Dakota is one, the people were pretty cool, uh, pretty laid back. There was no crime in North Dakota that I ever saw there. And then I flew a T-38. That was cool. And then we transitioned to our models. The R model tanker had the big fan motors on it. I'll roll in the picture right now. That's an R model. It has a CFM-56 putting out, I don't know, 20,000, 22,000 of thrust on it. And guys were really stoked in my, in my squad and they were mine out. When we upgrade, they are like, oh, dude, we're going to get R models. And I was like, oh, dude, we're going to go deploying more. 
that sucks. At the time, Southern Watch was going on. We we're enforcing the no-fly zones against Saddam Hussein. And sure enough, as soon as we got the Armada, they're like, boom, you guys are going. And thus started my long and very extensive desert time over there in multiple countries, mostly Saudi Arabia. Flying the KC-135s, refueling fighter guys who were enforcing the no-fly zone. Then I went to Spokane. Upgraded to aircraft commander, and here comes a story. As a new aircraft commander, and actually I'm going to roll in a different um, talking point here, and that is, uh, which one should I roll in now? Mm, how about this one? Be a quiet professional. Be a quiet professional. That's one thing I've always respected in my military service. I respect it here on YouTube. I respect it anywhere. I like guys that really deliver, but they don't talk much about delivering. They're doers. They're not sayers. They're not braggadocious. They don't act badass. Anybody who's act and pose, or all the big talkers don't deliver. Man, I can't tell you how many times I saw that in my Air Force career. Here comes another story. Let's go back to Minot, North Dakota. This didn't happen to me. It happened to a good friend of mine, Muddy Waters. Muddy, what's up? I know he'll watch this video. Great dude. He made a career out of the U.S. Air Force. Dude, seriously, why? Okay. <laughs> I'm just busting on him, dudes. But uh, he was flying with this particular dude, and I'm just going to call this dude the Terminator. Anybody who was in that squadron at the time knows exactly who I'm talking about, because that's what he called himself, I think. And so Muddy's flying a T-38 into Ellsworth. I think it was Ellsworth, right, Muddy? This plane right here, they're on short final. They lose a motor. They take a bird down the right motor. Kaboom! It compressor stalls. Huge bang. It basically blows up on him. Terminator's in the front seat, Muddy, my quiet professional friends, in the back seat. And by the way, you got to know this Terminator guy, big talker. And around the squatter, and he'd roll his flight suit up, and he'd walk around. He always had a scarf on, you know, he's acting all badass, and he's talking a big game, and he got the chaw going on, you know. He's, this dude's, man, he's awesome, right? That's what he wants you to think. They take the bird, Terminator starts, starts screaming like a girl. We're going to die, we're going to die! And at first, Muddy goes, dude, I thought he was kidding. I thought he was just messing around. Muddy's in the back seat, and in the back seat in the T-38, you really now have really good visibility. Terminator's flying the plane because in the Air ACE program, you didn't land from the back seat. That was something that instructors did only. We had to land from the front seat, so Terminator's supposed to make the landing. He has the visibility, and he has lost his mind. Seriously, he's checked out. X is like a cartoon character. Kajink, kajink in his eyes. It's like... He's non-functional. When you take the aircraft in a dual seat aircraft, especially when you can't see each other like T-38, you stir the stick. So Muddy comes back and says, shut up, I have the aircraft. And he says, give me the aircraft. And he's like, smacks the stick left and right, back and forth. They're only like on a seven mile final. And Terminator's still screaming. He's like, dude, we're gonna go down. Should we eject, should we eject? It's like, eject, we got a good motor, dude, shut up. Seriously, Muddy told the story and I was like, just like, what? This guy did that? And he's like, yeah. Freaked his cone. Muddy's as cool as a cucumber back there running his checklist, which by the way I have right here. Here's my old T38 checklist with all my notes in it. Still got it. Still got my G suit. Huh. Still got my helmet. That's actually my dad's helmet. He flew in Vietnam with. I had him uh, refurbished that and I flew T38s in it. How styling is that? Yep. Awesome. Muddy's taking care of business out there. Runs his single engine landing checklist, does the full face, shuts the motor down, pushes up the thrust. It's a cold day, they have plenty of thrust. No big deal. He's like, yeah, I lost the motor, I'm going to land. Meanwhile, <laughs> uh, Terminator almost said the dude's name. I don't want to do that. He's like freaking his cone. Muddy lands it, uneventful landing. He's a hero. Quiet professional. Muddy was a stud pilot. I flew with him in the KC-135. We're in the thick of it. Some really wild stuff happening. I never saw him lose his cool. He was just a great pilot. Really chilled out. Funnier than heck. Funnier than me, Muddy was. Those are the guys I respect in the United States military. Not the loud talkers. Not the guys that do all the pose and they think they're so badass and try to impress everybody. They're usually doing that because they're very insecure. Did you know that? That's why they're doing it. Okay, but that's not to say that I consider myself Joe Awesome Pilot. I upgraded to Aircraft Commander. Here comes the story I was launching on. At the time, we were taking the KC-135, the R model, over to the Western Rim, or the Pacific Rim. That is Japan, Korea, Okinawa. 
to do what were called channel runs, and that's where we would haul cargo because the C-141 was experiencing wing problems at the time. They're having catastrophic failures of their wing box, and so they're like, hey, Air Force goes, Air Mobility Command, there's my AMC patch, all wore out. AMC goes, hey, these are models. They're actually, you put some rollers in them, they're actually pretty awesome cargo planes. We can put a whole bunch of crap in there. We can load ordnance, lettuce, you know, I don't know, Playboys, whatever needs to get over there. We'll take it. And so we stepped into the C-141 mission and we started doing a lot of channel runs. And here I am, a brand new aircraft commander, and they're looking for volunteers. My hand shoots up. I want to go, I want to go, I want to go. Why? Because dudes, that's what we do. I think being part of a quiet professional is going where the fight is. You want to. And I see guys I respect the heck out of the, you know, with the fights going on in Afghanistan, Iraq, this younger generation, which I think is the second great generation. They're like, yeah, send me. I want to go. I want to be there. That's what I do. I train. I don't want to be hiding behind a tree and say, no, don't send me. Yeah, I do my fair bitching and moaning about deploying. I'm not going to say I don't, and I didn't. But as a young aircraft commander, the real world experience awaited me out there. Not flying around the flagpole at Minot and Spokane. And uh, so they're like, dude, you're in. Boom, you're going. So I'm a new, young aircraft commander. I'm going to try to make this story quick. There's so much detail. Coming back, and the thing was, is we had these huge, long missions. We'd fly like 10 hours over Yakota. We had no ground time or min ground time. They'd load, and we'd go shoot all through those, you know, the, you know, down to Okinawa, down to Korea, back through. And then we'd refuel minimum ground time. You're exhausted. You're on the back side of the clock. And then you go back to Travis Air Force Base to, in this case, I was carrying, I believe, four pallets of cargo and like 35 or 40 duty passengers, people deploying back to the United States. I'm a brand new aircraft commander, not brand new. I look at the weather at Travis and it's like horrible winds, direct crosswind of 35 knots. At the time, my buddy Jim Prisco, hello Jim, I hope you watch this video, man, he was a cool dude. You talk about a quiet professional, Jim was a quiet professional. He was a KC-135 expert. He was with us on that channel run. He'd been in the jump seat the whole time, and I'm looking at the approach. I'm looking at the winds, the direct crosswind, which, and if you don't know, landing this plane in a crosswind will kick your butt. This is an A model. The R model has a huge motors. Got like, what, eight inches or six inches of ground clearance there. So if you're screwed up on your controls, you drag an engine. Catch the engine on fire. It's a big deal. They call it dragging a pod. I have all this cargo and I'm exhausted from the channel run and I look I'm like holy cow I was scared I ain't gonna lie I was scared I was like oh my gosh dude <sighs> took a deep breath visualized success which I tell you guys to do and then I looked to the jump seat where Jim Prisco had been sitting to see if he gave, was giving me some support <sighs> look there he had left <laughs> I'm like what this is on short final, and I brief my crew, dudes, I'm going to try to make this landing. If it doesn't work, we're going around, going to our alternate. Two planes have gone around in front of us. And at that time, it was gusting to about, I don't know, 30 knots. Our legal limit was 25 knots, thereabouts, in the KC-135. This cargo had to get there. Was it time critical? I don't remember. So I had to say, you know what? Oh, well, time to man up. And I manned up. Nailed it. Nailed it. Perfect landing. I'll tell you, my yoke was deflected like this. That's your neutral reference position. You always yoke into the wind. Because if you don't, you go blowing off into la-la land. And you can actually depart the runway, drag your downwell, downwind nacelles, your motors, and it, it just gets ugly. And I'll tell you what, I was scared. And roll out, I'm like, oh my gosh, this wind is cranking. And, you know, and everyone's a little bit nervous and rolled out. And then you know, my nav ha had a great nav at the time. We had navigators in the plane at the time awesome gave me a high five and it felt so good expect fear conquer fear what had prepped me for that mission that day I would say one mental preparation because I visualized doing it and also another thing that helped is during every simulator period I did in the KC-135 the sim operator goes hey dudes we got some time what do you want to do I was like dial up the crosswinds dude dial them up let's go the guys I was always with would never do this. Why? Because what if you dick it up? You know, you could get a, a worse grade in the sim. You could actually fail. Like, whatever, dude. It's a sim. I want to practice. Become, because I know sooner or later that day is going to come out and I want to train for success. 
huh, that's what I did. I'd done 35, 25 knot crosswind landings from both sides in the KC-135. I got good at them. I didn't fear them. Well, I still kind of feared them. Because <laughs> it's a lot. It's a handful of jet. Expect fear, conquer it. Train out fear by practicing. And you guys who are, uh, you know, in other services, totally do that. You know, you, realistic training is where it's at. And then here comes another story for you now. Um, the Army at the time integrated. Here I am at 40 minutes. I'm going to have to wrap it up soon. Um, I actually was a safety officer later in my Air Force career, FSO, flight safety officer. And I actually loved serving in that because it directly contributed to our war fighting capability because it made our operations safer. It made my guys, my fellow pilots, safer and more knowledgeable to handle emergencies and combat conditions which we encountered. I'm going to cover those in other parts of the video. You'll like it. As a flight safety officer, uh, I actually instituted or helped institute a program at Fairchild called Operational Risk Management. Whoa! ORM? Nothing fancy. I just stopped watching the video. Uh, Air Force guys go, oh, ORM, that's so idiotic. Uh, maybe. Depends how it's instituted. But there is one very real concept in ORM that you really need to understand, and that is weighing risk and managing risk. I guess I'll throw that talking point out right now, is weighing risk and managing risk. The Army, which I learned in my study, had instituted the M1 Abrams. It's a turbine-powered tank. You guys know that. It's MBT, main battle tank. Its companion vehicle was an infantry fighting vehicle. still is the, M, uh, the Bradley fighting vehicle. I think it's M2, M3. It's paired up with the same type of turbine motor. Guys that watch this video that drive it know exactly. Watch their comments. They'll tell you all about it. Lots of info out there. Great vehicle. The problem they were having, I think somewhere along the mid-90s, maybe the early 1990s, is they were having rollovers with those Bradleys. They had these young kids in training events, both Marine Corps guys, Army guys, that in the training event, they'd get really excited, and that thing was fast. I mean, we're talking that turbo turbine-powered Bradley can get up and go. It's, it's meant to be paired with that M1 Abrams, you know, the IFVs carrying the infantry, the Abrams heavy armor. So they're paired up, whoa, going on the thing, and, you know, they would catch air with this Bradley, and next thing you know, the thing rotates, and they land upside down, and three guys get killed. Happened. Happened several times. So the Army just arbitrarily, and this is the military, all services are guilty of this, they go, you know what, we're going to put a speed limit on the IFE, actually, we're going to put a governor on it. I think they did speed limit, and then later a governor, it's like, we're not going to let you use it to its maximum potential. And so they started artificially constraining this weapon system. Some major in the U.S. Army goes, you know what, this guy was squared away, quiet professional. He was, I forget what his job was, I knew all the details at one time. He goes, this is kind of stupid. One is because we're limiting our weapon system. The whole reason that it has turbine powered and so fast is because it dodges enemy fire. Okay, the IFV, the Bradley IFV, it doesn't have heavy armor. It just depends on its speed. Yeah, it's got a 25 millimeter chain gun or whatever it carries, a Bushmaster. That's defensive armament in most cases. It's meant to get in and get out. When you say these guys can't go over 40 miles an hour, whatever the speed limit was, you are risking their lives. How about we do this, he said. How about we train our drivers to be better? How about we give them the skill set to manage the power and we give them realistic training? So he developed a training program for the Bradley and he started making these drivers, these young kids running around that IFE experts at the weapon system. Wow. He's like, okay, dudes, you got a lot of power. This is how you're going to use it. You're getting shot at. You need to just take a deep breath. <sighs> Look at the freaking terrain in front of you because you can kill everybody on board. That young driver will understand that. You have variances in skill levels, but they understood that. They took all the governors off. They gave them the full speed. Like, this is how you read the terrain. They put them in simulators. They drove them. And the rollover rates reduced by like 75% with his program, with re maintaining and honestly, actually enhancing weapon system credibility and effectiveness. And I thought that was an awesome story. Awesome story. Weigh risk. We have a risk here. Manage it. Don't run away from it. Manage it. Get better at it. There we go. I'm at my time limit, dudes. That's part one. Air Force stories with nothing fancy. When I come back, I think I'm going to start talking. There's still more things i got to tell, tell you about the quiet professional. Expect fear. Conquer it other fun stuff. I hope you're not getting bored because Net Fancy will see you in part two.